The Healthy Family Evolution. Mom Strong. This is Tim Terrio, owner and founder of Terrio Physical Therapy and Fitness, presenting a new look at how to get your family healthy. So how are we doing as a nation and as a county? Kern County ranks in the bottom 25% of all counties in six out of eight health indicators related to the cause of, causes of death. Heart disease, diabetes, chronic lower respiratory disease, Alzheimer's disease, influenza and pneumonia, and stroke. So with the chronic diseases, when we're compared in Kern County to the 57 other counties in California, 50, we're 58 out of 58 when it comes to deaths due to heart disease. And we're 57 out of 58 when it comes to death due to diabetes. And the other counties in the Central California are in the same boat. We're all in the bottom half. And then when you look across counties across the United States, there's a lot of cities that share our demographics. So why obesity and physical activity? So the percentage of adults who are now considered overweight or obese has gone above 60% nationally in some areas reaching 65 to 70 percent. The adults engaging in regular physical activity, well in Kern County it's 39.3 percent and again that's spread across the nation fairly consistently. So we're really becoming the United States of obesity and not the United States of America. And the sad part is that other people are learning as well. 7th graders or 7th grade students who are not in the healthy fitness zone for body composition is now almost 40%, 30 point, 37.3%. And the 7th graders who are considered physically fit has dropped to only 30%. So that's of 7th graders who can pass a physical exam. So we've got to get our kids moving again and having fun when they move too. There is hope, though, for especially for our children. Their studies show that when overweight, sedentary kids start to exercise regularly, their ability to think, to plan, and to do math improves. So please take note of that, school administrators. And there's also been brain imaging scans that, and analysis that shows that exercises increase activity in the parts of the brain associated with complex thinking and self-control. So again, the need to move shows up in our children. A randomized controlled trial study was done. These results were for overweight children. However, researchers believe that similar results would be seen in normal weight children as well. But we have to remember kids are not small adults. They don't need to be doing weightlifting programs at early ages. They need to play and they need to move. So how do we fix this problem? Well, it's simple. We eat better and we get more exercise. At least that's the advice we get all the time. And it becomes a source of frustration for a lot of us because that's all we know. We know it's that's what we're supposed to do. The problem is how do we do that? How do we eat better? How do we get more exercise? Well, then we turn to Google or any other internet search to find the answers. Or we also ask family and friends, and it seems like no matter who you talk to, there's an, a solution, but does that solution actually work? Well, we find lots of help, as we said, and we keep seeing all over and over again how fast and easy weight loss can be, losing 10 to 14 pounds, super fast weight loss. It's fun to lose weight. This is probably the only diet system that lets you eat almost anything you want without going to the gym. And then we've got all kinds of chemical concoctions out there that guarantee that they're clinically proven to help you lose weight. But doesn't this sound a lot like snake oil salesmen of the past? Promising results with everything? Or the garb and other items that you can buy that guarantee that you can dissolve fat by wearing a certain piece of clothing? And all this just can lead to complete anxiety and frustration because what we know is that is that the truth 
so why is there so many different people jumping in on this and how many and all these different chemical concoctions and supplements and diet books and diet drugs and different surgeries well it's simple the annual revenue spent by US citizens each year on weight loss is estimated to be between 20 and 40 billion dollars a year furthermore the number of people on diets in the United States at any given time dieters typically make four to five attempts per year the number of people on diets is 108 million making four to five attempts a year so that's 400 to 500 million different diets being tried each year so the percentage of customers consuming weight loss products and services who are female 85 percent so that's why you notice most of those ads are targeted to women so there's one more statistic that they don't tell you. What's the percentage of diets that fail? 95%. So they know that by producing new content over and over again, we will just keep buying that content to try to um, reach our goals and lose weight. But at the end of the day, it's a self-fulfilling business because they know that 95% of them will fail. So then you'll move on to the next product and buy that and try it. So why does this happen? It's because none of those programs are sustainable. Getting healthy is not a sprint. Even though we like to think that there's quick fixes out there and that we could get a magical concoction that helps us melt weight, weight away and get healthy instantly, it is not a sprint and it has never been a sprint. It's actually a lifelong journey. So that means it's a behavior change that we have to change our behaviors the underlying behaviors are what will lead to sustainable change the problem is that changing your behavior is really hard why well my premise is from a book that I read a long time ago um, nudge that equates the human being to a man or a person riding an elephant so we have to acknowledge that there's the elephant in the room the elephant equates to our emotional being, our emotional side of being human. And then the writer is the analytical or logical side. But the two have to work together or there's a constant battle. So the question is, we like to think we're in total control, riding along our writer and our elephant, working together, going down the path together towards a healthier lifestyle. But in reality, most of the time our elephants on full stampede our elephant decides where it's going to go and it's driven by emotion not logic so we keep as a nation describing the logical reasons that we need to lose weight and get in shape and the writer fully understands that the elephant doesn't the elephant understands what makes it feel good meaning what foods it likes to eat not being in pain so we have to remember to make room for the elephant because at the end of the day the elephant's the power and unless the elephant is wants to go down the path the rider is somewhat helpless and the only way a man can ride an elephant anyhow and control an elephant at all is by training it through a lifetime of training and making sure that the path is clear for the elephant at any given time if the elephant decides to leave the path or turn around the rider is somewhat helpless to actually hold on and get it to turn back around the elephant just decides to go eventually the rider joins him and begins to justify the reasons for not complete completing the task so we all have our dreams and I, I think dreams are more important than than goals because our dreams as Walt Disney pointed out all our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them and Walt's a perfect example of having your dreams dashed initially as he was undercut and his first character was taken away forcing him to regroup and come up with Mickey Mouse as the second character and then beginning to build Walt Disney brand but all along his life the bigger his dreams were the more people that stood in the way the more people said that it couldn't be done there could nobody would ever watch a full-length animated film 
nobody would ever attend Walt Disney Park as a theme park. And we all know, in hindsight, that Walt was right. But we have to understand that when we have our dreams in hand and when we start heading towards our goals, it's not a simple path. There's a lot of things in the way. We have people, relatives and friends, who stand in our way. And then there's the pessimists of the world telling us everything that will go wrong as we try to go towards our goals, knowing the direction with our dreams in hand. And then society will step in the way by telling us that, that that's not possible. And then there's the internal things like guilt and fear that block us. So we need a full realization as we head towards our goals and dreams of what really is possible. But wait, there's even more. There's our considerations, our fears, and the, our personal roadblocks that keep telling us to detour, to not enter, to turn around that we're going the wrong way. Everything in us lives to stay in that comfortable zone. So when we dream big and start moving towards it, we will see resistance. And that's where mindfulness comes in. Mindfulness is simply the non-judgmental awareness of what is happening in the present moment. It's actually full self-awareness of what and why we're doing. And why is that important? It's important because a majority of the people you see are walking around on automatic pilot and have no awareness of where they're going, what they're eating, what they're working on, what they're moving to. So we need to be mindful and build a program that can help us be mindful or aware of our nutrition and our eating. One of the largest problems with eating is that people are just completely unaware of what they're eating or how much they're eating. That's the real point of proportion distortion. When we eat more than we actually thought we did, that's simply a lack of mindfulness. So we need to be aware of what we're putting in our bodies and how much we're putting in our bodies at all, at all times. And then mindfulness with exercise. Mindfulness with exercise is actually realizing the point of the exercise, why we're doing it, what it should feel like, what it does feel like, and are we accomplishing and using the muscles that we need to be using on any given exercise. And same with our activity. We need to increase our activity. Obviously, as we saw before, a, minority, a very small minority of people actually get enough physical activity. We need to increase our activity, but we need to be aware of what we're doing, how hard we're pushing, and what does it feel like? Does it feel good, or is it causing us pain? And then just awareness of life. Where are we heading? What are we going for? What's our purpose? Are we living our purpose? Are we moving towards our our dreams by setting goals and, and taking the steps to have a full plan to get where we want to get in our lives. That final chapter when we're telling our kids the grand or telling our grandkids the story of where what we did, what we accomplished, where we came from, what will that story be? And I think it all comes down to five questions. I think it is possible to have anything you want but it comes down to five questions. Number one, what am I willing to start doing that will move me closer towards my goal, towards my dream? What is the steps I can take to move me towards my, my ultimate dream? What am I willing to stop doing that is keeping me from moving forward towards my dream? I have to take a look at what, will you, what are you willing to give up? What do you start willing to start doing and then what are you willing to give up to move towards that goal which then takes a step towards your ultimate dreams. Then I think the two biggest ones, questions we have to ask ourselves is, what am I not willing to start doing to help me move towards my goal? If you have a mental block and you won't do certain things, that you need to be aware of that so that you know what's standing, what you're not willing to do. And by the same token, what are you not willing to give up? If there's something that you're not willing to give up, whether that be time with certain people like your kids or it be a certain food or a certain drink or a certain habit that you just won't give up. I mean, we know that a lot of people, smoking is not a great thing. 
But if people are not willing to give it up, it just limits the how healthy you can actually become. But you have to be aware of why exactly that is. And number five, the biggest thing after you get through that is, am I willing to have the discipline that it will take to keep moving forward? Because this is not, like we said, a sprint. It's a slow, over the time, we slow and build up, right? Have the daily discipline to keep taking steps forward and know that we're on the right, heading the right direction with our dreams. So here's a, just a quick check to see what your dreams are and where you are. This is a mindfulness test. What's your body weight today? Write that down and take a look at it. What's your energy level on a 0 to 10 scale? If 0 to 10, if 0 is none, when you wake up in the morning, if you have no energy, if you have no vitality, if you can't, if you're exhausted just thinking about the day before you get out of bed, then you have a very low vitality or energy level. If you're ready to pop out of bed first thing in the morning, you're excited about the day and you have the energy to make it through the day and get everything accomplished, then you're an energizer bunny and you get a 10. But pick a number in between there that makes you feel that you think represents your normal energy level. And then how much physical act, moderate physical activity are you getting right now per week in minutes? Is it 30 minutes three times a day? Are you getting zero? Or are you getting 60 minutes of activity a day? And then how many medications are you currently taking? That's the, that's the numbers today. Now, what's the dream? What's your ideal? So for body weight, what's, what's your ideal body weight or dream? And make it a range. I like, I like people to pick a range instead of a specific number. But that's mindset. You have to set your goals based on your mindset, which is one of the things we teach people to do in this program. Um, but what's your body weight? What would your ideal energy level be? What would the ideal amount of physical exercise that you'd get a week? By the way, uh, most of the top professions recommend a minimum of 150 minutes a week to, to gain the top benefits. So that should be your goal if you don't have another one. Um, if you're already exercising a lot, 60 minutes a day would be an awesome one or 300 minutes a week to get 60 minutes of activity a day. And then how many medications can you realistically get down to? If you got healthy and lost weight and got your blood pressure under control and cholesterol under control and every, all the good stuff that happened with, with getting healthy, how many medications could you get down to? What would the, what would the ultimate be? So now I want to move into my view of, of life balance. So we keep hearing about this life balance and we got work on one end and family on the other end and it's sold as that the fulcrum's in the middle and we try to keep it balanced. But just basic physics, if the fulcrum's in the middle, that means that we have to have the same amount of weight on either end to be balanced. But anybody that's lived any amount of time in this world knows that there's pressure on the fulcrum, there's increased demands and work and then occasionally or at the same time there's increased family demands so the fulcrum is constantly being pulled on one side or the other so we end up when this happens reacting to what's happening but the problem with reacting is that there's increased emotion so when the emotion remember that's the elephant is the more powerful thing. So once emotion gets involved, now we're even more strongly being pulled. The fulcrum's being more strongly pulled one side or the other. Once the fulcrum moves, everything is out of balance. So basic physics again, if the fulcrum moves off center, even if it was originally balanced, it is now unbalanced. Who controls the fulcrum then becomes a major question. What if you knew you needed to temporarily shift the fulcrum to one side or the other? And then you choose to shift it and how far to shift it? What if you were in control of the fulcrum and know when you need to move it? You need to get support or communicate so that people on both sides know the demands on the other side so that you can stay in balance and have some help. Well, here's the big piece of news, right? You are the fulcrum. That's the piece of information we all need to understand. We are the fulcrum. We're the ones that have to get pulled either way and still try to balance both sides. You have the power to be the fulcrum, but only if you take that power, only if you're mindful enough to get your rider and your elephant working together and be the fulcrum 
and be in full control of your fulcrum so that you can keep things. So now I want to talk about the seven factors. So how hard is it to get healthy? Well, here's something I really like, which is the seven health factors for longevity. This comes out of research, and it tells people that the whole point of simple changes. So the first one is it's it's just a simple test. Do you do these things regularly? It's a yes or no. How many of these habits do you have? The first one is getting six and a half to eight hours of sleep a night on a regular routine basis. Do you get between six and a half to eight hours of sleep? Do you not eat unhealthy foods between meals? So we know now that it's good to snack on healthy foods to keep your metabolic rate up, but are you snacking on unhealthy foods between meals? Third habit, do you eat breakfast regularly? Fourth habit, do you maintain proper body weight? Meaning not BMI, but how close are you to your ideal weight or weight zone? Do you get regular exercise? Do you get exercise over 150 minutes a week? Moderate to no use of alcohol, meaning less than two drinks per day. And then don't smoke or use tobacco. So now tabulate up how many of those habits you have. Do you have zero of those things you do on a regular basis? One, two, or do you do all seven or six of them? So now know your how many of those habits you have because how much impact these seven things have. So now we look at your current age. So on the left you'll see there's the current age. So you find your current age. And then on the right you'll see the habits. So if you have seven habits you're the top score or the top scale. If you're zero to two habits you're the bottom of your age range. Look at the impact those seven things have. So let's take, for example, a 40-year-old person. So we go to the current age 40. If you do all seven of those things, your current health age is actually 28, even though you're 40 years old. If you do six of those habits, your health age is about 35. If you do five of those habits, your health age is about 38. If you do four of those habits, your health age is about 45. If you do three of those habits regularly, your health age is 50. And if you only do zero to two of those habits regularly, your health age is actually about 58. So the other one I like to point out to people is if we, so what's the point of continuing? Look at how the scale increases. Look at how wider as you get age they get. So the longer you don't do those habits, the more impact they have. Take a look up at 60. If you do zero to two of those habits, by the time you get to 60, your health age is actually 85. As compared to if you did all seven of those things, your health age would be 45, even though you're 60 years old. So 15 years younger or 25 years older based on those seven simple things. So as I said earlier, the goal is to get the elephant and the rider working together. In order to do that, the elephant needs to know what the dreams are, and the rider needs to know the logical side, and then you got to make sure you clear the path. And we clear the path through designing the appropriate program and where we want to go, what we want to do, who we want to be. And that's the way we're going to lead this new healthy family evolution. We're going to do it through making mom strong. So once mom is strong, the family will be ready for the healthy family evolution and we can combat the disease, the chronic disease states that's gonna, that are crippling America and the world. So for more information about our new program, you can go to myterio.com or go to my blog for more information, www.timterio.com. Thank you and have a healthy day.